1913 sun with a lot of history. Um, Jim's just finished it. Big, big restoration job. Um, turned out exceptionally well, runs well. I don't think it ever done a lot of miles somehow because everything was quite good in the engine, so the engines appeared more precision. Um, 1913 again. Um, luckily, it's got mechanical valve inlet and exhaust because it just changed from automatic to then. Uh, so beard more precision, the supplied engines to lots of manufacturers. Um, stirrup front brake, the proverbial stirrup front brake, um, which doesn't work all that well, but at least it's a brake. Um, so we go on the belt drive and um, this pulley engagement here where you actually wind that in and out which picks the pulley up and you get your drive you back the pulley off and you're in neutral so uh, early clutch job worked quite well um, that's the original light set seat which Jim managed to salvage which gives it a lot of character and you we put in new toolboxes because as you've seen in previous videos they were totally rusted out tank superb job jbs dave done that i don't think you get a better job that hand lined um beautifully paneled and um unbelievable that's your vonson retard where you can you adjust your ignition set setting uh, throttle here, air control here, and valve lifter here, so we made those handlebars up, had retubed the handlebars as you remember the original ones were very badly bent beyond repair so we were lucky to get um, the, the, that retube and up to speed. So managed to get a new belt which is very very difficult these days so probably that's the last new belt in the world so lucky to get that and um, all up to speed so a bit of history on this bike um, you could really have a documentary on it because 1913 young lad bought this bike fell in love with a young lady 20 year old Cora over in Norfolk she was a daughter of a wealthy gentleman so when Ben he the lad got a call up to join the army, so off he goes to war, leaves the bike and her property, and uh, survives the First World War, believe it or not, come back in 1918 to retrieve his bike and see his young lady. And uh, her father said, you're not good enough for my daughter, but her off like. So the lad was totally shattered. He disappeared and um, we're trying to find out his military campaign. He was in the railway, uh, railway, uh, railwaymen before the First World War, and I didn't know, but railwaymen were very, very important in the First World War because they had to go to France, build the railway lines right up to the front to supply all the gear, all the ammo and then bring all the wounded men back so there is serious serious importance to the war campaign so he survived that we're we're onto the army historians and they're trying to find out what campaigns he sold he fought on um, so he came back told him, the father said you're not good enough for my daughter so he disappeared he left the bike in her property. It, Cora was her name over in Norfolk. She remained a spinster, broken hearted, until 1960 when she gave this bike to one of her family members, Ewan Williams. She lives in Norfolk also. And he had it for many, many years until recent. About a year ago, he decided that he was never going to restore it. So he sold it to the heritage our heritage trust so it's been one of Jim's pet projects rebuilding it uh, it's turned out remarkably well I love the square barrel sort of B&B &B carburetor Bosch mag 
which is quite handy. Obviously the pedal gear is for starting and uh, foot rests on the front so you sort of you crank it up and then you crank it up like that and then you, when you're in right riding mode you're like this here. Celluloid grips are quite interesting but you see how the little hooks on the bottom so your hands don't slip off which was a feature in those days. So there we go wonderful 1913 sun a um, lot of history we'll probably come back to you when we find out the campaign to the last four horns so um, we'll put it to bed now in the museum all done and dusted lovely project and um, joining the veterans veterans That's a veteran bike with any bike manufactured up to 1914. After, four after 14, it was a veteran, so a, a, a vintage. So the, the veterans were pre 1913. There we go. So Another I explain project. about the, the difference. This hub and the Vinius free engine hub. Right, Jim, tell us about the um, the. This bike was like, originally fitted. Sorry, can I? It's right if we pass the, oh, the yeah. mic to yeah. Jim. I'll just pop it on there. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Just a little bit of technical interest. Um, this bike was originally fitted for this video three engine hub. Basically a hub with a with a clutch inside, which enabled you to stop the bike and keep the engine running. What it did is it disengaged this pulley here with the belt from the wheel. Now at some time that's gone wrong and presumably was unable to be repaired. So at some point in its life, somebody's fitted. This is called a Grado multi-pulley. We best film it from the other side, Matt. Which Sammy has already briefly touched on. Again, it's, it's a clutch which enables you to stop the bike to keep the engine running. And then when you want to pull away, you squeeze the, the pulley together that grips the belt and takes up the drive. This, this would have been like an aftermarket accessory of the day. It's something you could probably buy and fit to numerous bikes of, a, of this era. But our guess is that this was fitted because the original Villiers free engine hub had gone wrong. So that was deemed to be scrapped. So this was fitted in its place. And as you saw just now, it works reasonably well. Once you get used to it. <laughs> there we go. Let's go okay. to the workshop. Another project, FS1A 1972. Um, never believed that Miller would be working on an FS1A Yamaha, but this was as it arrived um, a few years ago. So, but there's such an interest now in early Japanese stuff and really everybody who comes in the museum probably started their motorcycling career with a Yamaha FS1E. They've gone up in value tremendously in the last few years so we thought that we would um, restore this one and put it on display so that all the gentlemen can relive their youth when they left school and they had a Yamaha FS1E. This is the early type hub brakes, which is very important. Later ones are disc brakes, but you don't want those. Hub brakes, I love hub brakes compared to disc brakes. Um, lovely type press frame, as you can see. And um, this was your toolbox here, where you drop that off. And hey gusto, your survival kit was in here, so. Um, there you go, Pre nice press frame. Uh, this is a candy gold colour, which is a very pretty, and it's a very modern colour now. If you look at lots of Mercedes cars and bikes and stuff that drop back onto the 1972 colour, candy gold. I like it quite a lot. Um, where have we got to it, Dave? This is a bit of carnage here. Luckily, Jim's a good electrician because Miller's rubbish. Um, so this is all, of, that's the switch. 
some of the electric gear. So we couldn't buy a new um, wiring harness for it. Quite difficult. So Jim will salvage that. We've got lots of drawings, lots of photographs. So um, a big project. Um, so there we go, we'll be firing that up probably shortly. The seat's coming from Germany, the dual seat from Germany, none available in the UK, so it'll arrive shortly. We move on, the famous Honda RC181. What's this doing in the workshop? Well, tomorrow uh, we're having a big Honda festival here in the courtyard, and probably a couple of hundred Hondas here tomorrow, so. Alan Millard's coming down, so we'll fire up his Honda 6. This is a four cylinder, 500cc. Great Mike Hill who won the TT on such a model. You remember him and Augustine were having great duels and um, neck and neck all the way until Agostini's uh, chain broke up on the mountain and um, Mike went on to win. Evil bike to ride. Um, lots of design um, mistakes. In the early days, they didn't realise that you needed big, very big swinging arm spindles. You see, that's only 15 mil, where it should have been 20 mil. If you look at the back wheel spindle, it looks about 12 mil, which is absolutely crazy, where it should be at least 15, 18 mil. So you got a lot of flexing because. The, um, the, the spindles weren't strong enough to take the racket. If you look at swinging arms today and Grand Prix bikes, they're big monster aluminium casting jobs. Seriously big spindles. You also look in here the, how that X um, support, they put that in afterwards on the later models to try and stiffen up the back end. That X support there to keep the back end of the frame from doing the woolies. Um, have this off here. That's where the battery sits in there. We're actually waiting for a new battery to come today, otherwise we've got to fire it up for you. But um, there we go. Big, big tank again. Um, I've ridden this quite a bit at Goodwood and at Mallory. Donington, serious bike to ride. Uh, twin sided twin front brake, twin cam, so serious brake, probably the last brakes before they went to discs, but um, there you go. So we'll move on, this one, um, we got recently, what is it? It's a bi-van, which Daft as it may seem, it was a van motorcycle. You put all the, all your boxes and deliveries in here, you sat on the top. Um, if you think of Kentucky Fried Chicken, you think of McDonald's where you get delivery lads with big boxes hung on the back, which are not very stable, the centre of gravity is mile high, so really I know it was a failure because the guy didn't, the designer went about it the wrong way um, and he, he manufactured the engine, the forks, the wheels, the tank and the, the, the cost of manufacturing must have been totally horrendous so um, they never really caught on. This is the only known surviving one in the world and it's done very little miles so we're on, on the way with it. Um, we'll probably run, run through a few details. We've had it um, grip blasted and painted. We did the wheels. They're all ready to go. And this is the body here. Um, we've just had the bodywork painted in the original colors. Um, so in here, is where you put all your gear and um, this is your lid that pops on here and you sit on top of the lid so um, quite 
and then the, all the forks best go in here. And um, everything is, if you look at it, it's so mad. The designer, instead of using sort of production forks, just redesigned his what he thought the fork should be. Super complicated. Can you imagine getting the castings done, the tooling done, even to manufacture the forks? Same with my bench and, and Jim, Jim, put hold it up here, Jim. So this is the battle go. I'll just drop that out there. So Jim is going to, I'll stick that up there so you get a rough idea of what's going to happen. So that goes in there like that. And that sits. And then J Jim will pop the engine on there. So like it sits that. like that. Um, that's kind of annoying. The other way around, but not to worry. Yeah. So, and all these things here, like manufacturing that, just crazy, you know, crazy. Um, the engine's a one, 148cc, two stroke. Remarkably good condition. Jim's been inside it and it's like brand new because I think the speedo shows about 200 miles. So we move on. Um, this is the, the back wheel here I'm just working at. Um, this is the sprocket. We've had the, all those zinc, you see. Nice zinc along with all the other bits. But if you look here, you see you get this lock back here and you say to yourself, cross where, where does all those go? Well, if you remember, we did some photographs, right? Two dots, so you have two dots there, so you know that goes up there. And then the coil mounts, um, again, you'll find one dot for the coil mount, one dot there. So it simplifies that lot, you're not wrecking your brains. Um, this is the, the rear shoes, all remarkably good condition, um, really car type wheels you see, 15 inch by 425, four, you get serious problems too with the painters, um, Miller sealed these off here before they went with the painter and his wisdom decided that what stupid old Miller put freaking blanks on top and bottom for so it wouldn't get painted in there. So now I've got to get all that paint out of inside there because um, that won't go in there any longer. Test the character. Stupid design. You, you wouldn't believe it, if it unless you didn't see it. The weight of that, like quarter plate, and all that does is go behind here. All oh, that does, believe it or not. And again, stupid old Miller, you see what he does here. He's just put top on there. Top T. It goes inside the back of here to hold the battery where that's ready. 18 gauge, more than adequate. So you're adding serious weight to the thing, putting quarter plate on. Right, we're on the sprocket here, so I had to clean the paint off here because, um, again, the ambitious painter put too much on it, so to get that off, you got to gently get this, that's this, this, these. So you just go right in there and take all the paint off gently, so that fits, and then you need to tap out the holes because the paint's in those, and they won't um, so that you get all the muck out of there so that when you go to put the screws in um, um, it's uh, easy peasy so there you go so you just do those and then you just run them up with the old 516 There you go, nice and neat. So you've got another five to put in there, so I won't bore you doing that. So then we go on to other bits and pieces. Um, if you um, 
you do is shift that over. The um, speedo, if you have a look at the speedo here, so it needs a bit of a fettle, so um, we just drop the screws out of there, making sure we don't lose them because I wouldn't want to go down to Halfers for some of those, you know. So then you get the speedo, it'll come up. A speed of, that's a Smith's D, we call it Smith's D section. So there you go, you drop that off there and you get that off there. And then um, if you have lost my WD 40, I've got it in the works. Just a second, I'll get another one. So, how you generally clean the, the, the dial up if you just gently spray it like that? And then you get an old toothbrush. Don't throw your old toothbrushes away. And then gently go through the, the clean it all up and then you, you get them back back to life so after you've done that you get it sort of back to that condition there maybe we should put a bit of polish on there just to brighten it up a bit and um, so then probably later what I'll do I'll paint the needle because you see it's a bit dull brighten it up a bit so what we what you do with that is what you did, used to do when you were in the Boy Scouts when you had to clean your badges you got a bit of paper like that and you worked it through like that there so then you got the needle like that so you just paint it paint it with nice white paint then drop it off like that there and there you go you so I'll do that I won't bore you we paint the, the body up like that clean the glass up pop it in there like that and hey gusto you'll have a nice almost new speedo they're very hard to get now those D section speedos because um, like lots of things haven't been manufactured for a long time and um, getting serious this is the other end of the speedo we had a look at the D section speedo head so we, we have a look inside here and the early bikes this is the speedo drive here what's your opinion that turns the gearbox and then you get a cable from there up to the head so that all works but you need to set that up quite diligently so that you've got nice clearance and nice drive and how you decipher the drive if you put that in there and then turn it you can see this you can see the drive working so there we go um, when you've got into this situation here you need to check that it, it all works nice and free it's not jamming up here and the brakes are all working proper you know like that so um, there's a little bit of mist here um, in the early days these little covers were put on here so you had a grease hole there so you pop pop that on there like that to cover up the um, hole so that dirt and grit doesn't get in so there we go we're cracking, cracking on um, these are the uh, feet for the um, that go up through the body here. So you've got these um, on here. If you have a look, the um, sterilizing feet. So when you stop, you can push them down. Center stand really. So they they pop up through here and appear in here. There's a spring goes down in there, so they appear there. So. I hope I can remember how it all went back together again, so test the character. Um, so there we go. There's where we're up to at present. Um, next visit we'll probably have it now on up and running. Speedo drops in there, which is quite nice little feature. Um, got the hinge there for the top pan, put all your boxes in there. So there we go, another day in paradise.